All right. Good morning, good morning, my dear Mercy family. I love you so much. I'm so thankful to be here together with you again today on this fine August Sunday. My name is Jason, and I'm excited to explore Mark's gospel again together with you today as we continue going verse by verse through that book in our sermon series. But first, uh, before we do, a quick little story. I just can't help but tell. I, it was November 6th, 2017. I actually know the date because it's on my phone. And I was in Israel with my new bride. And the team took us to an archaeological site called El Araj. This is a picture of El Araj. And you can see that uh, that river there is actually the Jordan River. And the excavation, it's a little difficult to make out, but there's a pile of rubble on the other side of the dig. I took another photo that day that's a lot closer. It makes it a little bit easier to see. You see the dig there, it's like a pillar and a wall and stuff. On the other side of that, do you see that pile of dirt? It's just trash, really. It's what the bulldozers and the backhoes had kind of moved out over in that direction. And I was with the group, there was a guy in the group named Bill. Bill sort of lost interest in what the guide was saying, and he sort of wandered back onto that pile of dirt, and we're all kind of like, oh man, Bill, what are you, what are you doing over there? I'm like, yeah, good grief. He comes over after a little bit and nudges me and says, hey, Jace, you know, I, I think I might have found something. Why, can you come help me dig it out? <laughs> and, uh, and I'll admit, what I thought when he said that was, yeah, you know, Bill, uh, I'm actually interested in what the guy has to say here. Turns out I don't make it to Israel all that often, as in only time in my life. So uh, why don't you go play in the dirt, and I'll listen to what we came here for. We can both get back on the bus happy. That's what I thought. What I actually said was, okay, sure, man. He took me over to that pile. We're rummaging. There was like a little exposure of a stone, maybe like that big. I don't know what he saw in it. I'm like, oh, let's get this over with quickly so I can get back to listening. We're digging, we're digging. And sure enough, after a while, like the stone's bigger, there's like a leg. Like, whoa, hey, what, what's that? Digging, digging. Wait, there's a face. There's like an animal in here. And Bill was right. I was wrong. Right? Bill was right. I don't know how, but... This is what we uncovered. It's a lioness. Pretty crazy. And these pictures were taken by my wife, who was no doubt laughing to herself, because you can see Bill and I, the frustration on our faces as we're trying to hoist that thing out of the uh, rubble there, and we couldn't get it to budge. I mean, it didn't look that big. I was like, Bill, we're gonna have to turn in our man card on this one. Like, what's the problem? Couldn't move it at all. We had to leave it there. We actually had our guide inform the authorities, and it became big news. Yeah, uh, <laughs> here's uh, what they found out. Right? It was in some archaeological journals. Uh, this is uh, one that actually was online that they wrote just a few days after we found it. It turned out to be like one of the most significant finds of that site. It was a, it was a very new site. It's only a few years old, El Araj. And uh, you see the crane sort of hoisting it out there. That's the whole thing. It's in a museum today. And when they did, they weighed it. It turns out that it's 1,300 pounds. Yeah, so if you could maybe do me a solid and just mention to my wife on the way out, you know, like it was 13, you can say it just like that, 1,300 pounds. Uh, but it's a lioness that we find in synagogues, ancient synagogues. And it says here on the article that it's 1,500 years old. That's what they dated it immediately after finding it. But you know that last year, uh, an archeological, archeological set of students actually found another one of these. Same style, this one, a lioness nursing some cubs. They found it in a site that's about 20 miles from here, back up in the hill country called the Golan Heights. And that lioness, they confidently dated 2,000 years old. So I can't help but at least speculate a little bit if they're going to redate this one. And I'd hope that they do because you know that in my heart of hearts, I'm wondering 
if maybe Jesus himself saw this very Linus in the synagogue in that town. Now, why do I tell you this crazy little story about a place called El Arash? Well, for two reasons. One is that it's so emblematic of our passage today that in a wasteland, something seemingly insignificant is pulled out and becomes a treasure. And there's more than one irony there because the second reason that I tell you this story today is not just because of how it happened, but also because of where it happened. See, the name of the site is El Arash. The name of the city is Bethsaida, the most mentioned city in the, city of, in the Sea of Galilee in the Bible, apart from the city of Capernaum. It's the hometown of Peter and Andrew and Philip, and all the gospel records corroborated, and Luke's gospel specifically tells us that today's passage takes place in Bethsaida. Now, you remember a couple of Sundays ago that Jesus sent out the the apostles, two by two, we go to the next slide, maybe. There we go. <laughs> and they go out into the region and proclaim the kingdom of God there. And they generate quite a groundswell. All of these people come back. The apostles themselves come back to Jesus today. And there's so many people that are coming to see Jesus that they hop in a boat in Capernaum and they'll travel in that boat across the Sea of Galilee to the region of Bethsaida. Today's passage, Jesus is going to perform the only miracle that's in all four gospel accounts apart from the resurrection itself. It's come to be known as the feeding of the 5,000. And it's going to take place near Bethsaida. So now, let me tell you a far better story. If your Bibles are open, it happens in Mark 6, beginning in verse 30, which says, The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them and ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had a compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late... His disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the loaves, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. You pray with me. Oh, our Father, God, thank you for this amazing passage of an amazing miracle, Lord. Our understanding is limited. Lord, we bring you our five loaves and two fish. We pray that you will make much of it in our hearts today. By the power of your spirit, will you help us today to know you better? Now, my God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Christ's name, amen. Sheep. 
<laughs> I almost can't even say the word without smiling. It's a pretty silly creature, it is. Um, I told my wife years ago that a sheep was actually one of my favorite animals. I think she thought I lost my mind. It was like a sheep? Uh, have you ever done that icebreaker with the silly little question, stupid little question? If you could be any animal, <laughs> what would you be? I hate that icebreaker. Well, I mean, let's face it, nobody in the history of the world, I bet anyway, ever chose to be a sheep. Even a sheep wouldn't choose to be a sheep. I mean, the sheep, it strikes terror into the heart of no living thing on the planet except a blade of grass. It's hardly fearsome. I mean, they're totally helpless, totally defenseless, totally confused. They really are. You're talking about an animal that will literally walk off the edge of a cliff if the one in front of it does. Not too bright. I, mean, I hate to laugh about that, but they're not bright. It's hardly an impressive species, right? But, you know, the reason I'm so fascinated with sheep is not because they're so impressive. The reason I'm so fascinated with sheep is that time after time, my God tells me that I am one. All we like sheep have gone astray, turned aside each one to his own way. The question for us isn't whether or not we will be sheep. The question for us is what kind of sheep will we be? And like sheep, it's our nature to follow. So the question becomes then, who exactly are we following? Because there are many choices. There are many shepherds. But scripture reminds us even today that there's only one shepherd who is worth following into our most desolate of places. We're told three times in our passage today that this story happens in a desolate place. And that's what you might call a powerful problem, the kind of problem that can lead one to panic and hopelessness and doubt. And many of us have been in a desolate place. And many of us are maybe in one right now. But if you haven't been, know this. There is a desolate place up ahead. And there will ultimately be only two ways to approach it, as a powerful problem or as powerful providence. We are but sheep. Up ahead is the wilderness. Now what do we do? Our passage today isn't just amazing because there's a jaw-dropping miracle performed. It's also that through Jesus alone, we see a desolate place juxtaposed with a satisfied soul. Today, in a desolate place, Jesus compassionately teaches his followers that he is the only real direction and rest and provision that can truly satisfy them. Now, brother, sister, are you satisfied? Are you seeking that satisfaction where it can actually be found? You know the famous quote from, from John Piper. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Not in our circumstances, not in our bank account, not what's on our plates or in our homes. Satisfied in him. Follow him and he'll take care of the rest. In fact, no pun intended, but that's our first application to consider together today. To follow a shepherd who satisfies our need for rest. You know, I was busy on Thursday doing work, running around. I got a notification on my phone that reminded me that Thursday was National Relaxation Day. Did you guys know that? Thursday was National Relaxation Day. I didn't know that. I kind of wish that I hadn't learned that. <laughs> I gotta be honest with you. I was actually more relaxed before I got that notification than afterwards. It made me realize that it does no good for others to say, hey, time to relax. Hey, take a break. Hey, enjoy some rest if you don't truly have it. But what about the kind of rest that we need? Or the kind of rest that sometimes needs to happen in a desolate place? Well, Jesus is going to tell us about that. In verse 31 and 32, that's mentioned that this miracle 
It's going to be a breathtaking miracle regardless, but why here? Why a desolate place? He's not just telling us about what Jesus did, but also pointing us to who Jesus is. You see, because Mark's point here is highlighting Jesus as leading his people to a wilderness. And that's going to call to mind Moses leading his people to a wilderness. And the miracle performed in the feeding of the multitude bread will picture Moses ushering manna down from heaven to feed the people bread in the wilderness. That's in Exodus 16. Jesus will do that, though, by his own power. He isn't just another Moses. Jesus is the better Moses. That's what we see throughout this passage. What about our desolate place? I mean, our desert, our time and place of pure emptiness. We've had those. Think about COVID. Remember COVID? Thank God I can say remember COVID. Remember downtown Seattle, seeing pictures of downtown Seattle? Well, that was a desolate place. Remember that suicides and suicide attempts skyrocketed during that time? Why? Why? As people entered into a wilderness and did not have true rest. So sadly, they tried to attain it themselves. But it could be a loss of a relationship, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of one's health, loss of one's saving and retirement, loss of a dream, even a sense of purpose, loss of a community. Praise God that Jesus knows us and knows us better than we do. He knows that we need true rest, and sometimes that needs to come by going into a desolate place. Because when you're in that desolate place, guys, there is only him. That's the point, that you'll cling to him there all the more. True rest, and I mean the kind of rest that restores and satisfies your soul, it can only be found in him. And we see that there's so much going on. All of these people are, are there coming and going. It says the apostles had no time, no leisure even to eat, which is interesting, right? Because it suggests to us that even a good work can become problematic to us. My brother and his wife, Michelle, they live in California. They were part of a church years ago that attempted to open up a satellite location. And I visited several times. It was really impressive. The people were so diligent to serve, and they were working so hard just Sunday after Sunday. But what struck me was that when you actually sat down, so few of them could take part in the worship. So few of them could actually listen to the message. And I would ask my brother and his wife time and again, how's it going? What's going on there? You know, what's what's the situation like? And time and again, I got the same message. We're not being fed. We're not getting fed. And that whole venture eventually died. And it makes sense because it was literal, spiritual starvation. Something Jesus reminds us to watch out for here. Life and ministry is something that requires a good stewardship. We need to be serving and we need to be feeding. And we need to avoid both of those extremes like doing nothing but serving and nothing but feeding because those extremes lead to Christian burnout and Christian couch potato. They do. We need, to ser- we need to steward both serving and feeding well. Now, if these were the only verses that we read today. We might get the impression that Jesus is sending them off into a desolate place on their own, except for one powerful little word. He says in verse 31, come away by yourselves. Not go, come The stress there, I can't stress it enough, is that this is not a call to isolation. This is a call to fellowship with God. 
We do not find true rest apart from Jesus. So you won't be without Jesus when it's time to be in the wilderness. He doesn't send us off to find rest. He is with us in that rest. And the bigger picture is he is with us as our rest. The author of Hebrews makes this point in chapters three and four of Hebrews. He makes the case that Jesus is the better Moses, just like our passage today does, because they both led their people out of bondage. But you'll remember, those with Moses rebel. And so that generation does not enter into God's rest. They don't enter the promised land. The next generation, the baton is passed to Joshua. And Joshua, like Jesus, is going to lead people into that rest. He takes them to the promised land. But we know that they don't ultimately attain that rest. Because again, they were rebellious. And he's making the point that like the rebellious generation of Joshua and Moses, there's no Sabbath, like there's no rest for those who rebel against Christ today. For God's people, for those who are in Christ, those who don't rebel, there is a Sabbath. There is an ultimate rest. Take a look at what he says in chapter 4. He says, for if Joshua had given them rest, implying that he didn't ultimately, God would not have spoken of another day later on. That's today in the context of the passage. I mean, today, those who are rebelling, you don't have that rest. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. And you see that The true rest of God is pictured by but something bigger than the promised land of Israel. The true rest of God is something pictured by but something bigger than the Sabbath day in the law. It's Jesus. If we don't have him, we don't enter into God's rest. The land and the Sabbath pictured him, pointed to him, not the other way around. He is the promised land. He is the Sabbath rest. And Joshua didn't ultimately give the people satisfying rest. Jesus does. Jesus led his people to and fed his people with true rest, where Joshua couldn't. Jesus is the better Moses and Jesus is the better Joshua too because he offers a better rest. So follow him who alone satisfies our longing for a better rest, but also follow the one who satisfies our longing for direction too. I mean, let's face it. We're sheep and sheep just don't come up with trustworthy direction on their own. Well, they don't find the way on their own. They need to be led. They need to be shown the way. They need direction. And when our needs are at stake, we simply do best to be fed by a good shepherd who, who knows that. A good shepherd that will do this for his own good and for our own good. Take a look what the passage says. The The disciples realize that there's a problem here, right? And so they start offering suggestions. And we see in verse 36, the suggestion that they offer is that these people need to go buy themselves something to eat. Well, it sounds practical. It sounds like it would make sense to us. Maybe we'd offer the same thing. But you see there a heart, which is interesting, that what they offer is independence. What they offer is self-reliance. What they are trying to do for the people is a self-salvation. It's, that's what their answer is versus a dependence. And this help yourself to salvation kind of thing is always going to be a false gospel no matter what way it comes at us. This idea, oh, let's do it ourselves. Let's, let's have them do it themselves. Self-sufficiency, self-promotion, that somehow I can even earn something from God, even a good standing before God. God. If I just keep the rules, if I just do it right, I'll gain his favor. Friends, fellow sheep, that's the wrong direction. We follow our shepherd. We don't go do it on our own. We don't make our own way. He is the way. It needs to 
be given to us. Eternally speaking, we cannot buy ourselves, cannot earn ourselves something to eat. It needs to be given to us. What we need is not self-improvement. What we need is grace. And others need it too, not to send them away like the disciples suggest. The disciples suggest to God, send them away. I think if we're fair, our hearts way too often say the same thing to God about those that we might not have patience for. Lord, send them away. Oh, mercy. Do you ever consider what it would have been like if Jesus had said the same? If Jesus suggested to God, Father, send them away. Let them find their own food. Let them find their own way. Praise God that Jesus took on flesh and became like us, but did not become like us. No, instead, he says what his father said to him. You give them something to eat. Verse 37. With one command, he shifts their focus from giving instruction to receiving it. Complete dependence, one command. A whole new direction. But we read, <laughs> we read that, I mean, we say what undoubtedly the disciples must have said. That's impossible. That's impossible. <clears throat> exactly. It's just like the old adage says, the Christian life isn't difficult. It's impossible. We need him. That's the whole point. Jesus is teaching us, yes, you can only do so much. You're finite. You're exhaustible. But you aren't actually the limits of you when you have me. You don't have scarcely enough to feed yourselves, much less feed my sheep. But the size of your problem is no comparison to the size of your God. He's not excluding himself from the equation the way that that they tried to exclude themselves. He's including himself. You see that? He's requiring himself in the equation. And he is requiring our participation too. That's powerful. He's a God who invites us to take part in this, even in his miracles. And he gives even more direction at that point to help his sheep do this. You see, in the next couple of verses, he basically is going to give two directives. The first is, what do you have? Right? We got loaves, go see. What do you have? I don't care about what you don't have. You shouldn't care about it either. Bring me what you do have. And the second is, sit down. Be still, little sheep. I love that it says he commanded them to sit in groups, and then they did sit in groups. The word groups there is actually two different words each time in the Greek. And they do shed some light on this that's really interesting. When it says that he commanded them to sit down in groups, that word groups is symposion. It's the Greek word for party. It's a dinner party where you'd expect entertainment and lively discussion with each other. You see what he's doing is he's encouraging fellowship. He's putting fellowship even in this miracle. And when they sit down in groups on the green grass, that word for groups is prasia. And interestingly enough, that means garden bed. You see what he's doing? He's He's recreating, he's reforming something, a garden in the midst of the desert, in the desolate place. He's bringing order from the chaos. He avoids a frenzy before it can even occur. And even the people being divided up into hundreds and fifties, it alludes back to the Exodus again, when Moses was told by his father-in-law, Jethro, to appoint trustworthy men over groups of thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. That's in Exodus 18. But Jesus is going to draw further on that image of leading Israel in the wilderness, making the multitudes manageable by groups. It's, he's showcasing solid direction and order, which is it's so important for us to see. It's interesting, too, because there's such a popular movement today of Christians that want to deconstruct their faith. Maybe you've heard of that. 
as though the direction and the stability and the framework of our faith was such a negative thing. Guys, Christianity is not a faith of deconstruction. Christianity is a faith of reconstruction. That's what Christ did for us and in us. Reconstruction, it's resurrection. And Christ is Lord. He gives order, he directs, he commands, and we obey. And that you ultimately cannot dismantle that. I mean, it's certainly not gonna sit well with a lot of people. I, I, I get that, but that's how it is. Even for people that grew up in the church, they don't like that. But he is Lord. And you tear apart everything, and eventually you're left with nothing. You're left in the chaos. You're left in the wilderness of your own making. There's no lasting satisfaction there, friends. There is not. And if that's where you are, guys, even if you've made an absolute train wreck of your life, would you believe that Jesus can pull you up out of that trash pile and set you on your feet with true direction, real purpose to show you the way again? Follow him. He alone satisfies our need for rest and direction as well as our very real physical needs. I mean, he's the one that taught us, give us this day our daily bread. And we don't serve a God who's unaware of our physical needs. He himself experienced those needs too when he became a physical man. And what we physically hunger for, what we physically need, our God provides to us. You are testimony to that. You are breathing, you are sitting here, you have been provided for. See what he says in the following verses. He shows that he physically provides for them. He broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples in verse 41. Any of you watch The Chosen? Maybe some people like The Chosen. I gotta be honest, I've only seen like two episodes of The Chosen, so I can't like steer you away or to The Chosen, but you know what? I couldn't help in like preparing for this. I just wanted to see the scene in The Chosen where Jesus feeds the 5,000. I mean, why not, right? Maybe get you all pumped up, get some imagery, see how they depicted it. The way that they depicted the feeding of the 5,000, uh, Jesus basically said a blessing, broke the bread, and then the disciples had like baskets on the ground. They open up the baskets and there's just tons of bread in there. Okay, I mean, I'm not trying to tell you it absolutely could not have happened. I wasn't there, okay? But there is sort of a, an exegetical clue here that might shed some light on this for us and help us understand a bit what could have happened. And that's the word gave itself, did do my. You see, it's an imperfect active verb. That means it's ongoing. He didn't give them like one time. He kept on giving, which is interesting because that also means that he kept on requiring his disciples to come to him for food, didn't he? That pictures so nicely what he teaches us in that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. That we're always mindful, always approaching, always needing him for our physical needs. And it reminds us to always be thankful too. I love that. Because what he does first in verse 41 is that he looked up. You see that? He gives thanks He's teaching us that. What I have, God, you have given. What I need, you always provide. What I want, you know completely. What I do, you receive glory for. Whatever has been, is now, will be in my hands. Lord, I give you thanks. He looked up to heaven and said a blessing. And you see what he's picturing there. See what he's doing is he's performing the duty of a priest. He's the mediator between God and the people. And he's not just any priest. He's the high priest. He's the priest for all the people. This high priest lives forever, though. He's always going to be high priest. And we're reminded in Hebrews 7 and 8 that even the high priest had to go and give an offering for his own sins before he gave an offering for the people. But this is a sinless man who receives 
this offering of five loaves and two fish. This is a sinless man who gives thanks and pronounces blessing on the behalf of the people and distributes a blessing on the behalf of God. No one ever did it better. No one ever can do it better. Jesus alone is our perfect high priest, our only mediator with God. Jesus is the better high priest. We see that here. It says in verse 42, you have to love it, that they all ate and were satisfied. As is the case throughout the Gospel of Mark, the biggest overstatements are made in the most simple of understatements. And I love verse 43. It's like the exclamation point on it all, that this wasn't just enough. This was more than enough. There were baskets filling over, right? Twelve baskets, which, which is meant to remind us of yet another aspect of who Jesus is. We see it in 2 Kings chapter 4. It's a chapter where there's basically miracle after miracle that the prophet Elisha performs. And let's see what he says here. Let's, you tell me if this sounds familiar to you. A man came from Balshalisha, bringing the man of God, that's Elisha, bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley. Now, the first fruits of the barley harvest, we know, is around the time of the Passover. It's basically the same weekend as the Passover, which John 6 tells us is when this feeding of the 5,000 takes place. So you have the same time frame. And even the barley loaves, we're, in, we're told in John 6, is what is offered. They're eating barley loaves. This is around the same time with the same components. Elijah says, give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, give them to the men that they may eat, for thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them and they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. Does that sound familiar to you? Elijah, Elisha, performed more miracles than any other prophet, at least that we have record of, even his predecessor and teacher, Elijah. And God performs a miracle here through Elisha that feeds a hundred men. Now, Jesus is seen through this event. And Jesus mirrors the feeding of a hundred men and performs a miracle receiving less and feeding more. Not a hundred men, but five thousand thousand men besides the women and the children Matthew's account tells us in Matthew 14 Jesus isn't just another prophet Jesus isn't a prophet on the level of Elisha Jesus is the prophet who is to come John 6 Jesus is the better Elisha he's the better prophet so we follow a shepherd who satisfies us with true rest, with good direction, satisfies our physical hunger, and we follow a shepherd who satisfies our spiritual hunger too. He's the better prophet, and the prophet's words are the very words of God. Jesus himself reminded us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we need his words to feast on. We need something for our spiritual hunger. And in Mark 6, we see that. Because in Mark 6, we're actually given a big picture comparison. You'll remember last week, we talked about the beheading of John the Baptist. And that whole charade takes place in a big banquet that King Herod throws for himself. But in today's passage... We have a banquet too, a banquet from another king. We have, in a sense, a tale of two banquets, a contrast of two kings. One is held by a king of wickedness, and the other held by a king of righteousness. One gave others to serve himself, and the other gave himself to serve others. One held a feast for personal friends, hand-picked, top-level aristocrats only, and the other held a feast for all who would come to him. 
One was moved to sin by sexual corruption, and one was moved to sacrifice by a shepherd's compassion. Jesus gives the better banquet, guys, not because of materialistic reasons, but spiritual ones. Jesus gives the better banquet because Jesus is the better king. He's not a king who caters to raunchy displays. He's a king who cares about our deepest needs, our spiritual needs. That's my king. I wonder, do you know him? Because my king loves you, fellow sheep. Take a look at what our king does. He comes onto the shore, and we know, of course, that he addresses the crowd's physical needs. We just saw that. He fed them physical bread. But notice here what he did first. He began to teach them many things. He fed them spiritual bread first, things their shepherds should have taught them. It says that he had compassion on them in verse 34. And that's not a surface level feeling. That word, splonk nizomai, it, it means a gut wrenching response, gut wrenching compassion. That's the level of care that he had for the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And that's something that God really cares about. Take a look at what God said through the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 34. He says, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. And down to verse 5, he says, So they, they were scattered because there was no shepherd. They became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. That feeding that he's referring to right here, it's, it's spiritual feeding. Israel's shepherds weren't doing that. They weren't bringing the people to God. And God's furious about it, which calls to mind some of our leaders, those that we might choose to follow. Now, it's whether it's in a work capacity, a politics, sports, health, fitness, diet, medicine, certainly our spiritual leaders. Friends, if, if those leaders aren't leading you to Christ, if they aren't bringing you closer to him, shepherding you to your good shepherd, can I just suggest to you that as impressive as they might all seem, they are all ultimately noise. And if they aren't helping you get to him, helping you get others to him, then they are, in fact, helping you to wander. That's what sheep do. Your good shepherd, he wants to feed you, and your enemy wants to feed on you, so beware. But God has a rescue planned. We see that in the same passage later on. In the prophecy, he'll say, I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be prey. I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. That's the Messiah. And he will feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant shepherd and my servant David shall be prince among them. And I am the Lord. I have spoken. So you take this to the bank. And we do because this prophecy is fulfilled. You see it in the feeding of the 5,000. Our good shepherd proves he's the better shepherd that feeds God's sheep everything that they spiritually need. There's no, no better way to illustrate this than through the heart of a believer. A dear sister named Tanya. Many of you have met her, have prayed for her. Her father just died a couple weeks ago. And understandably, her family right now is going through severe grief as they prepare for his memorial this coming Saturday, actually. And she emailed me yesterday, and I want you to see part of what she said. She said, amid the grief, that's a desolate place, undoubtedly. 
I still praise the Lord. That's a satisfied soul. I praise him for the time I had with my dad and that our last words to each other were, until we meet again, either here or in the presence of Jesus. I praise him that he is the God of all comfort, that he is near to the brokenhearted and that we do not grieve as those without hope. Please pray that we continue to cling to the Lord and his word for comfort. That's the miracle, friends. That's the miracle of the 5,000. That's part of the miracle experience we have even today. That's something only a satisfied soul, only a spiritually fed soul can do. Praise him amid the grief. Jesus doesn't just feed 5,000 men. He feeds our souls today and forever with something they hunger for and no one else can fill. Bread that keeps on feeding. Comfort that keeps on comforting. I'm talking about hope fulfilled. I'm talking about Jesus as the way, the truth, the life. And Jesus who shows us his way, shows us, teaches us his truth, gives us his life. I'm talking about the gospel. I'm talking about the good news that saves, the good news that sustains, the good news that satisfies. So I'll end with the same question that I started with. Mercy, are you satisfied? Are you finding real satisfaction, that kind of satisfaction, even in your desolate place? Satisfaction that knows strength out of weakness, courage out of fear, light out of darkness, hope out of hopelessness. A God who created you, who knit you together and knows you best, also loves you and knows how to feed you best. Now trust him to satisfy your soul. I pray if you haven't done that already, that you'll do it today. If you will, come to a compassionate shepherd. I mean, a shepherd who showed compassion, the level of a cross for you. There will be people up here on my right and my left when we finish who would love to talk with you, love to pray with you about this satisfaction called Jesus. Because God doesn't just give us something good. He's given us something better. His only son, Jesus, the better Moses, the better Joshua, the better prophet, the better high priest, the better king, the better banquet, the better shepherd. Jesus, the bread of life that can fill you with baskets left over. In the last chapter of John's gospel, a resurrected Christ confronts Peter. You'll remember, asks him three separate times if Peter loves him. Here's what he says the last time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he'd said to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Have mercy, family. If you love him, if you've been fed today, if he's fed you, then let's go make sure that others are too. Let's feed his sheep because they're out there. They're wandering, sheep without a shepherd, sheep needing his compassion, who don't have his direction, who don't know his rest, who aren't experiencing all the good that he can provide. Now let's feed his sheep, Mercy. Let's feed his sheep. He told you, he told us, you give them something to eat. Feed them his grace goodness, mercy. Feed them his love. This world is hungry, hungry for something that only he can satisfy. Now let's give them all something to eat. Father, God, I'm so incredibly thankful to you for all that you provide, for all that you are, that you are a true rest, true direction in our lives, Lord, that you are both physical and spiritual sustenance, Lord, you provide and then some. God, I pray that we would do it well. We would feed your sheep well that they may know you the way that we have known you. God, would you make much of that in our lives? We are your five loaves and two bread. Magnify what we do in glory of your great name, God. We pray in Christ's name, amen.